Hey everyone, let's pick up where we left off. We were discussing limits of sequences and we learned about this associated function that allows us to use rules that we learned for computing limits of functions to compute limits of sequences. <clears throat> and so what we had, remember we were, we, we were concerned with computing the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, right? And we know that that's equal to L if and only if limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals L, where f of x is the associated function. Remember, that's the one that you get by replacing uh, n with x, right, in the sequence. And so this technique is going to work uh, most of the time. There will be a few cases, and we'll, we'll talk about when this may not be the right thing, but this is one of our standard procedures for computing limits of sequences, is to instead consider the associated function. Now, in addition, we're going to need some, some help in computing limits, and so there are what are called the limit laws, right? And uh, so let me just write these down. So let's assume that um, we've got a couple of sequences. So let's assume that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals L, and um, we've got another sequence, let's say limit n goes to infinity of b sub n equals some number m, right? So we have a couple of convergent sequences. a sub n converges to l, b sub n converges to m. <clears throat> now, there are going to be five limit laws here. So the first one tells us <clears throat> that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus or minus b sub n, right? So if we take these two sequences, we can add them together and create a new sequence. And the limit is computed in the obvious way, right? We get L plus or minus M. So what that tells us is compute the limit of A sub N, compute the limit of B sub N, and then add or subtract as needed. <clears throat> um, sequences also work nice in, uh, when it comes to multiplication. So limit as N goes to infinity of A sub N times B sub N is going to equal the obvious thing, multiply the two limits, so you get L times M. Um, uh, limits work nice with division also, so uh, limit as N goes to infinity of A sub N divided by B sub N, that will equal L divided by M. Well, this is almost true, of course, we can't divide by zero, so this is true as long as M is not equal to zero. Um, the next one, uh, if we, if we have our sequence a sub n and multiply by a constant, let's say little c, right, so c times a n, right, that creates a new sequence, and the limit will be the obvious thing, it's c times l, and then the last one, <clears throat> uh, if, say, p, I need p greater than zero, yeah. and a sub n greater than zero, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n raised to the p, so you have your sequence and you raise all the terms to this power p, right? This comes out to be uh, l raised to the p, and this works as long as, as p is a positive uh, real number and a sub n is also positive. Okay, so those are the limit laws, and these allow us to, um, to, to compute limits. So let's just see how you would use these in action. Um, so let's see. First example, let's look at um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> limit as n goes to infinity. n squared plus n divided by uh, 2n squared plus 1, all raised to the fourth power. All right, now what we're supposed to do is say, okay, what we have is a sequence inside that's been raised to a power, which means that I can use limit law e to actually compute this. All right, so what do we get? Well, we say, okay, we know how to compute the limit of polynomial over polynomial, right? The associated function, if you replaced each of these with x's, would be a polynomial. When you take the limit and the degrees match, 
inside these parentheses, what we get is the number that is obtained as the ratio of the leading coefficient. So I've got a one for the leading coefficient here, a two down here. And so what this gives us is one half for the limit inside. And then we raise that to the fourth. So what we get is a one sixteenth. <clears throat> All right, so there's one example of applying the limit laws, and you can use these whenever, whenever you need to. Um, ah, another, and, and oh, and I should point out before I move on to the next thing, those limit laws should look ex very familiar. They are exact analogs of the limit laws that you learn when you're studying the limits of functions as x goes to infinity. Right? So I don't need to spend a whole lot of time there. You've already seen these. And so let's move on to the next one. And this is one that you've probably heard of before. And I want to, right, you probably learned the squeeze theorem, or sometimes it's called the sandwich theorem. Um, the squeeze theorem, you probably learned for functions. And what I want to do now is phrase it in terms of, of sequences. So let's say we have three sequences that look like this. So if uh, a sub n less than or equal to b sub n, less than or equal to c sub n, and the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals some number l, which equals limit as n goes to infinity of c sub n. So we have three sequences, and we happen to know that the limit of the one on the left and the right both approach the same number, right? So the limits are the same in the same number l. So if this occurs, then the one that's stuck in between gets squeezed, and so the limit has to be exactly the same. So um, if all this, then the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n also equals L. <clears throat> so the idea is you'll be handed some complicated, you know, more complicated looking um, expression, some, some uh, sequence, if, so, so think of b sub n as some complicated one, some unknown limit. If you can put something that you know on the left and the right, right, you know the limits on both the left and right, if they approach the same thing, then you can make a conclusion about the one in the middle. So let me do a couple of examples of applying the squeeze theorem. Um, first example, let's look at the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, cosine of n divided by n. Now, <clears throat> here's the idea. I'm going to apply the squeeze theorem to compute this limit. Now, what I know about the cosine is that it stays between plus and minus 1, which means then that minus 1 over n is less than or equal to cosine of n over n, which is less than or equal to 1 over n. So now, here's the one that we were handed. That's our unknown. And I compute, I, I know the limits of both of these right here. All right, so we can say, uh, since limit as n goes to infinity of minus 1 over n equals 0, which equals limit as n goes to infinity over 1 over n, um, uh, we conclude that the limit as n goes to infinity of cosine of n over n equals 0 by the squeeze theorem. The one that we were interested in, the one that we were handed, has been squeezed between two familiar sequences, right? These whose limits are easy, easy to compute. And let's do one more example of squeeze theorem. And this is one situation right, where this is really the only way to do it. I mean, this, this example here also really the only way to do it. But... In this case, what I want to look at 
I want to compute the limit as n goes to infinity of n factorial divided by n to the n. Remember, and just, just in case you haven't seen this, I, I, my guess is that you probably have seen factorial, but let me just remind you, right, n factorial means 1 times 2 times 3 dot 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 down to n. So what you do is you multiply all the integers starting at 1 until you get to n. So for example, 8 factorial, that would be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8. Also, um, you know, so, so, so 0 factorial is defined, so remember this, right? By definition, 0 factorial is equal to 1. We're going to see factorials a lot in this class. Right, here's, here's the first time. Okay, so I'd like to compute this limit, and, and I should point out that uh, when we're working with sequences, right, uh, the associated function uh, can be used in most cases, but factorial is one place where it doesn't make sense, right? Factorials only make sense when this number is an integer, right? So x factorial makes no sense if x is one half or some, some other number, right? So when you have a factorial, the, uh, the associated function procedure all right, it's not, it's not usable. So instead, what I want to do is use the squeeze theorem. And so let's see. Um, well, let's just write this out. Uh, let's think about this one. So n factorial over n to the n. All right, that's a fraction. Its numerator will look like this. 1 times 2 times 3, dot, dot, dot. And eventually we get to n. In the denominator, we have n to the n, which means we have n factors of n. Now, what I'd like to do is think about this fraction right there. So look at what I have in the box. And in fact, so, so here's what I want to do. I want to think of it, what do we have? A 2 over n inside my box. 2 over n times 3 over n. There would be a 4 over n, da, 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 da. Eventually we get to n over n. Now, how big is the fraction that's in the box? Well, the point here, if you notice each of these fractions, their numerators are going to be less than or equal to n, which means that each of these fractions here is less than or equal to 1, which tells us that the stuff in the box is less than or equal to 1. So n factorial divided by n to the n is equal to 1 over the n times something that is less than or equal to 1. And this is what I'm going to do. This is going to allow me to set up my, um, to set up my fraction here. 0 less than or equal to n factorial over n to the n, which is less than or equal to 1 over n. Why is that? Because if you take 1 over n and multiply it by the rest of this stuff right here, this thing that's less than or equal to 1, it makes it smaller. All right, so 1 over n times the stuff in the box is smaller than 1 over n. Okay? So that allows us to set up this, <clears throat> this inequality. And then we can say, and by the way, 0 is the sequence, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so what we have is, um, since... The limit as n goes to infinity of 0, the 0 sequence, equals 0, which is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, we conclude that the limit as n goes to infinity of n factorial over n to the n equals 0 by the squeeze theorem. So when you're applying the squeeze theorem, what do you need? If we think about the two examples I've done. First, you need to set up a true inequality. Then you need to analyze the limits on both the left and the right-hand side. And if you can show that those are equal, then the one in the middle has to equal that same limit. 
Um, okay, a bit more to talk about still. Um, so the next thing I want to say, and this, this, this is, let's state this as a theorem, so let me put it here. When we deal with sequences in this class, a lot of times the sequence will be bouncing back and forth, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And that alternating uh, um, uh, uh, characteristic sometimes makes things a little bit more complicated. So here's one thing that will allow us to simplify things. So it goes like this. If... The absolute, oh, if the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the absolute value of a sub n is equal to zero, then the limit of the original sequence a sub n is also equal to zero. So what it says is, when you have this thing that's sometimes positive, sometimes negative, if you can just make it all positive, by taking the absolute value and get a limit of zero, then you can conclude that the original sequence also approaches zero. So for example, uh, let's compute the limit as n goes to infinity of minus one to the n divided by n squared. So notice what's happening with that numerator, it's bouncing back and forth between plus and minus one, which means that our fraction is bouncing between plus uh, 1 over n squared and negative 1 over n squared, depending on, on the choice of n. And so to compute this limit, what I want to do is take the absolute value. So we can say since the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of minus 1 over n over n squared, let's see, that's going to equal, well, it's just going to equal this. And so now what do we have? We've got a fraction where the numerator is staying fixed at 1. The denominator is getting larger and larger and larger. This limit is definitely equal to 0. You can get that just by considering this as a polynomial or a polynomial. Um, so since we have this, uh, we conclude by the previous theorem, right? We got a limit of 0 for the absolute value. That means that the limit of the original sequence also has to equal 0. So we conclude that the limit as n goes to infinity of minus 1 to the n over n squared equals 0. Um, <clears throat> down some facts here. I'm going to call these standard limits. These are ones that we'll be allowed to use whenever we need to. All right, so you want to keep these uh, as facts on hand that we'll, that we'll need uh, on occasion. So first one, um, limit as n goes to infinity of a natural log of n divided by n raised to the power p, where p is any number greater than 0. Right? So natural log divided by n raised to the p is going to approach 0 for any positive number p. Right? So natural log loses to any n, n, you know, to n raised to any power p. Right? That's a useful one. Um, the next one... And you can verify each, uh, you can verify that by L'Hopital's rule if you like. Um, uh, the next one, limit as n goes to infinity of uh, the nth, oh uh, yeah, the nth root of r. Right, so r is some real number. It needs to be a positive real number so that we can actually take roots. Right, this limit is equal to one for any real number greater than zero. Right, so as you take successive, uh, you know, higher and higher roots, right, that, that's going to approach 1. Uh, the next one, limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus, uh, what do we want, 1 plus r over n raised to the n, that equals e to the r. You can verify this by taking a log and actually, you, know, you can actually compute this one. Um, but it's worth memorizing. In fact, we did this where, uh, in the last lecture where r equals 1, right? And we found that it was equal to 
to e to the 1. More generally, if we have an r in place of that 1, right, we get e to the r. And like I said, I don't think you should memorize this one necessarily, but it's one that you want to be aware of, right? And so when it comes up, <clears throat> when I write down the answer in certain situations, you should just recognize, oh yeah, that comes from one of our standard limits. Uh, the next one, uh, limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of n, that's equal to 1. These two look similar, but notice in the first case, r is a constant. In the second case, this n is a variable, right? n is going to infinity in both cases. Um, the next one, and this will be important for something that we do uh, fairly soon, the limit as n goes to infinity of r raised to the nth power. Right, this one's going to be important. Um, it's going to equal various things depending on the choice of r. So let me write them all down in one piece. So let's see. Um, if the absolute value of r is strictly less than 1, then this limit's equal to 0. So if you take some number between minus 1 and positive, num positive 1, and raise it to higher and higher powers, what happens if that, that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, approaching 0? <clears throat> Um, if r happens to be 1, then of course you get 1. If r is negative 1, then it's going to bounce between plus and minus 1, which means that the limit does not exist. Um, so this is if r equals negative 1. And then, uh, let's see, so what happens... <clears throat> Need a little more room here. Oh, and in fact, I could do this a little better. If r is less than or equal to negative 1, that limit does not exist. And then if r is greater, so it's going to equal infinity in the case that r is greater than 1. Okay, so here's the limit of some number r raised to the nth power for all possible choices of r. And let's see, oh, one more. So this will be, I guess I can put it down here. Uh, so standard limit number six, limit as n goes to infinity of um, r to the n divided by n factorial, that one's equal to zero. So let me do a couple more examples here. Let's say limit as n goes to infinity of um, negative 2 fifths raised to the n. Well, let's see. According to limit law number 5, right, we have a number whose absolute value is less than 1. That means that this limit is equal to 0. Um, uh, another example. Limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of uh, n to the fifth. Well, I don't know. It almost looks like this one right here, but not quite. So let's see. I need to manipulate this one a little bit. So this is going to be, um, well, okay, what does this mean? Limit as n goes to infinity of... Um, n, so let's see, the nth root of n to the fifth can be rewritten as n raised to the 5 over n, which is equal to um, limit as n goes to infinity of um, n to the 1 over n raised to the fifth. Which is equal to, see, now I can apply limit law number, I guess it was number 4. Um, so this will be the nth root of n raised to the 5th. Now we know that this is equal to 1 raised to the 5th power, which is equal to 1.
One more important fact when it comes to limits. And so that goes like this. So and, and we'll make use of this fact quite a bit. So um, if f of x is continuous, so we just have some function. And um, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals some number l. Then, when we do composition, so limit as n goes to infinity of f of a sub n, that equals f of l. Right? So this works as long as we've got a continuous function. So let's see how this works in practice. Um, so first example, let's compute the limit as n goes to infinity of e raised to the uh, n plus 1 over 3n plus 1. So what you want to do is view this as composition where our function f of x is equal to e to the x and a sub n is this fraction n plus 1 over 3n plus 1. And so what we're supposed to do is compute the limit of the sequence in that and find our number l. In this case, uh, let's see, as n goes to infinity, n plus 1 over 3n plus 1, that'll give us 1 third. All right, that's polynomial over polynomial, so the degrees match. So we get a one-third. And so what will we get here? <clears throat> we will get e raised to the one-third. So what this theorem says is take the limit of whatever sequence you have and then apply the continuous function to the result. All right, so let's try another example of that. Um, how about limit as n goes to infinity? square root of 3 plus cosine n divided by n. Square root is a continuous function. So what our theorem tells us is compute the limit of the, of the sequence inside and then take the square root of the result. So let's see what we've got here. 3 plus cosine of n divided by n. That looks like a mess. You know what this one looks like? This looks like a job for the squeeze theorem. So what we have, uh, let's see, how big can our numerator get? Well, cosine could be up to 1. So this is going to be less than or equal to 4 to the n, or 4 over n. And let's see, it's also going to be no bigger than 2 over n. And as n goes to infinity, that one approaches zero, that one approaches zero. According to the squeeze theorem, the one in the middle has to approach zero also. So what do we get for an answer then? The sequence inside the square root approaches zero, so we get square root of zero, which equals zero. Um, one last thing before we, we end here. In this class, let's see how, how long we've been going here. Yeah, in this class, <clears throat> we're going to be taking limits of sequences all the time. Uh, the main technique that we're going to use to compute the limits of those sequences is to consider the associated function. And many of the limits are going to involve indeterminate forms. So I want to remind you who the indeterminate forms are because we're going to see these. We're going to encounter indeterminate forms constantly. So let's just say this is a quick L'Hopital review. The indeterminate forms for which you can apply L'Hopital's rule are right there. 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. That's the only time you can apply L'Hopital's rule. So if you have a limit, some fraction, where the top and the bottom are both approaching 0 or both approaching plus or minus infinity, right, then you can just apply L'Hopital's rule, take the derivative of the top, take the derivative of the bottom, and recompute the limit. Um, <clears throat> there's also the indeterminate form 
infinity minus infinity. This one, it's not, I don't know, it's not real cut and dry. Typical things that you use here, get a common denominator sometimes, uh, you apply the conjugate. It's, it's a um, more obscure one, but it does show up every once in a while. And so remember that infinity minus infinity, that's not equal to zero, right? It's an indeterminate form. Um, zero times infinity, also an indeterminate form. When you have zero times infinity, it's not equal to zero, it's not equal to infinity. Remember what you do, divide by the reciprocal of one of the functions, and that will convert it, it will manipulate it, into one of these two indeterminate forms, and then you can apply L'Hopital's rule. And then the last of the indeterminate forms, one to the infinity, zero to the zero, and infinity to the zero. <clears throat> these are the ones where you take the natural log. Apply a rule of logs, it will then convert it <laughs> to this one right here. In that case, then you can re you can divide by the reciprocal, and that will give you something uh, where you can apply L'Hopital's rule. So for all the other indeterminate forms, these ones right here, whoop, your goal is to manipulate it so that you can then apply L'Hopital's rule. You're trying to get it into one of those two indeterminate forms. Okay, so this is a good place to stop, um, and we will pick up with the next material on, um, let's see, today's Tuesday, so it'll be on Thursday. Okay, see ya.